Chapter Twenty Eight of Unto Caesar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. Unto Caesar by Baroness Orksey. Chapter Twenty Eight nothing is secret which shall not be made manifest st luke eight verse seventeen caligula himself led the way to the tricilium and dea flavia followed him he threw himself upon a couch and she with her own hands served him with wine and fruit he refused to eat but drank freely of the wine while she stood beside him calmly waiting until he should be ready to go seeing blanca cross the atrium she had called to her and ordered her to serve the soldiers the men were grateful for they were exhausted they had not tasted food since the day before and had been on the watch round the caesar's person all night the underground passage which runs beneath the declivity between the two points of the palatine and by tortuous ways under the temple of jupiter victor on its highest summit did connect the house which dea flavia now occupied with the palace of augusta the latter since the death of the great imperator had been used entirely as a hall of justice a few scribes alone inhabited the rearmost portion of the huge edifice the passage itself abutted in dea flavia's house on one of the small rooms that lay round the tricilium there were several such passages connecting the various palaces on the palatine but their existence was not revealed to the army of slaves only a few responsible ones knew that they were there in this instance the caesar could from the tricilium reach this road to safety without again crossing the atrium and encountering the prying eyes of hundreds of cowardly slaves he had no thought of thanking dea flavia for what she did for him but having drunk his fill he rose from the couch and made ready to go she escorted him to the door of the passage and gave brief instructions to the men how to proceed she had lighted a small lamp which would guide the caesar and his escort on their way from the door the flight of precipitous steps led down into the darkness caligula was the first to descend and his soldiers followed him the one who held the lamp keeping close to the caesar's person dea flavia stood at the door until the footsteps of the men ceased to send their echo back to her along the vaulted passage then with a sigh of relief she closed the door on them and hastily fled from the room her one desire now was to shut out as completely as possible from her mental vision of the picture of her shattered ideal the degradation of that majesty which she had honoured all her life so imbued was she with that sense of honour and of reverence for the caesarship that she would not dwell in thought on that awful sight of the caesar grovelling in abject terror at her feet she wished to forget it to forget him the man who in her eyes was already no longer the caesar for the caesar was a god and like unto a god in glory and in dignity whilst caligula her kinsman had sunk lower than the beasts almost involuntarily she had turned back towards the studio a while ago she had wished to look on the praefect of rome as he lay in a drugged sleep desiring to assure herself that all was well with him then the advent of the caesar had interrupted her over an hour had gone by since then and the whole aspect of the world had changed the caesar was a fugitive and a coward and the people who had the upper hand were prepared to acclaim the hero of their choice 
the atrium now was gloomy and deserted the slaves gathered together in their remote quarters shunned the vastness and the enforced silence of the reception halls they preferred to huddle together in close groups and corners distant from the noise of the street dea flavia stood quietly listening still from afar came the insistent cries of death and of vengeance still overhead that lurid light and smoke-laden atmosphere but now those same cries almost seemed drowned by a sound more persistent if less ominous the sound of heavy pattering rain on the leaden roofs and into the marble basins of the impluvium whilst the roll of jove's thunders appeared to be more nigh it was obvious that the storm which had been threatening all the morning from over the campagna had burst over the great city at last it was jove's turn now to make a noise with his thunder to utter cries and howls of vengeance and of death through the medium of his storm and to drown the fury of men in the whirl of his own now a vivid flash of lightning rent the leaden sky overhead and searched the dark corners of the atrium dea flavia uttered an involuntary little cry of terror and hid her face in her hands a high wind howled among the trees outside the house dea could hear the tiny branches cracking under the whiplash of the blast breaking away from the parent stem and sending an eddy of dry dead leaves whirling widely along the narrow streets and into the open portals of the vestibule she could hear the fall of the torrential rain and the flames which sacrilegious hands had kindled dying away with long drawn-out hissing moans of pain she could hear the wind in its rage lashing those flames back into life again and could see through the opening overhead the huge volumes of black smoke chased across the sky smoke and flames were fighting in an even battle against the persistent heavy rain the wind was their ally but he was gusty and fitful now and then helping them with all his might fanning their activity and renewing their strength but after a violent outburst he would lie down and rest gathering strength mayhap but giving the falling rain its opportunity the rain had no need of rest it fell and fell and fell steadily and torrentially searching the weaker flames killing them out one by one to dea flavia's straining senses it seemed clear that in this storm the number of rebels had greatly diminished none no doubt but the most enthusiastic remained to face the discomforts of drenched skin and bone chilled to the marrow no doubt too the gale blowing the flames and smoke hither and thither on the exposed slopes of the palatine had rendered a stand in the open unmaintainable all this of course was mere conjecture but the young girl worn out mentally and physically with the nerve strain of the past four and twenty hours was grateful for the momentary sense of peace the steady fall of the rain acted soothingly upon her senses her wearied thoughts flew aimlessly hither and thither on the wings of her imagination only the storm frightened her because she was not sure if it were an expression of jove's wrath or whether his mighty hand had only scattered the infuriated populace so that she dea flavia could weigh the destinies of rome in peace she thought of going quietly back to her room to think a while in the solitude the danger being less eminent gave her leisure to ponder and to weigh in the balance her allegiance to caesar and that other nameless sense within her which she did not yet understand but which invariably drew her wandering thoughts back and then back again to the man who lay in a drugged sleep under her roof he slept and throughout the great city the people called on him hail 
taurus antenor hail she sighed and involuntary tears gathered in her eyes but the sigh was not one of sadness rather was it one of longing for something intangible and exquisite and this longing was so sweet and withal so mysterious that instinctively she turned away from the magnificent reception hall towards her own room with a wild desire to be alone and nurse that longing into an all-compelling desire it was at this moment that five or six men all wrapped in dark woollen cloaks entered the atrium from the vestibule and catching sight of the augusta called to her loudly with greetings of respectful homage she paused angered at the intrusion peace and solitude seemed indeed denied to her to-day but recognizing the praetorian praefect as the foremost of her visitors she could not owing to his high rank dismiss him from her presence cassius nepos had already bent the knee before her he looked flushed and agitated as did most of the others only my lord hortensius marcius who was in the background looked pale and wan from the terrible exposure of yesterday she did not think to wonder how these men had entered her house how they had found their way to her presence past her janitors and without the usual formalities and ceremonies of introduction which her high rank demanded she knew that her slaves were demoralized that men who had been friends of the caesar were now fugitives and vaguely thought that the praetorian praefect and his friends had found their way into her house as into a likely haven of refuge and would the next moment be kneeling at her feet begging for protection and shelter just as their lord and caesar had done on this self-same spot half an hour ago your pleasure my lord she asked to speak with thee privately o augusta said caius nepos sinking his voice to a whisper my friends and i have tried all the morning to forge our way through the mob and to reach thine ear but the praetorian guard faithful to me was unable to make headway then did we think of covering ourselves with dark cloaks and of following the crowd as if we were one with it until it led us to the precincts of thy house the storm as it broke overhead was our faithful ally the crowd has sought refuge against it under the arcades of the forum and the slopes of the palatine are comparatively free yet do ye want shelter and protection from me asked dea flavia she had no liking for these men all of whom she knew caius nepos selfish and callous ancreus the elder avaricious and self-seeking young excanes whom she knew to be unscrupulous philippus decius whose ostentation and lavishness she despised she vaguely wondered why my lord hortensius martius was among them nay gracious lady said cassius nepos suavely tis not thy protections which we crave save for a few moments whilst we lay at thy feet our desires for the welfare of rome the welfare of rome she queried vaguely i do not understand ye what hath ye coming hither to do with the welfare of rome allow us to make the meaning clear to thee o augusta but not here where prying eyes might be on the watch or unwelcomed ears be prepared to listen grant us but a brief audience in strict privacy the destinies of rome are in thy hands she made no immediate reply but as was habitual with her she tried to read with searching eyes all that went on behind the obsequious masks wherewith these men sought to hide their innermost thoughts from her and as she peered into their smooth humble faces all at once she knew why they had come she knew it even before they put their proposals into words 
she knew why the praetorian praefect was so servile and why my lord hortensius martinus despite his obvious weaknesses wore the an air of triumph they had come to betray the caesar and to place the destinies of rome in her hands it was strange indeed that this mealy-mouthed sycophant should be using those very words which had stood before her eyes like letters of fire searing her brain ever since she had stood there half an hour ago with the grovelling caesar at her feet the whirl of thoughts which rushed to her brain now made her giddy instinctively now as she had done then she looked down on her hands those hands which were to guide the destinies of rome and her heart had a curious twinge of pain almost of fear for she realized more fully than before how small and delicate they were time walks closely on the heels of destiny o augusta urged marcus ancorus the elder in his gently insinuating voice for the nonce jove hath damped the wrath of the people of rome but that wrath is only dormant it will break out afresh the storm in the heavens will pass by but the tempest caused by a raging mob will reawaken with double fury in thy hands augusta in thy hands she knew that all these men wanted was to use her as a tool a puppet to dance to their piping she knew that anon they would be as ready to betray her as they were betraying their caesar now yesternight had they come to her with their proposals she would have rejected them with unqualified scorn but since yesternight she had seen the caesar abject cowardly degraded dragging his bespattered majesty across the floor of this house she had measured him not by what he represented but by what he was and she had taken his measure and that of another and the caesar was lower than the brutes and that other was greater than men a silent voice a whisper which may have was an inspiration caused her to look toward the studio in there my lords she said pointing to the door we shall be safe from watchful eyes and ears and i will listen to what you have to say she chose not to see the look of triumph which flashed from six pairs of eyes but calmly led the way towards the studio cassius nepos and the others followed her without a word dion and nolus rose as she entered and she dismissed them whilst ordering them to wait her pleasure outside the door the two men brought up in the school of slavery were too well drilled to marvel at the gracious lady's many moods they did not even cast one look in the direction of the inner room where they knew that the praefect of rome still lay in a drugged sleep as soon as they were gone dea flavia turned again to cassius nepos and to his friends i pray you sit she said simply she herself sat on a high chair with circular back carved of citrus wood but cassius nepos and the others preferred to stand End of chapter 28chapter twenty nine of unto caesar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada unto caesar by baroness orksey chapter twenty nine for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light st luke sixteen verse eight cassius nepos was the spokesman of the party 
his high rank and great influence with the guard under his command gave him certain privileges which his friends were always willing to give him they did not know of his treachery to them nothing indeed had occurred to make them guess that the man who in a sense had been the leader and organizer of their party had betrayed them all to the caesar in the hopes of greater gains once he knew that his adherents had no thought of offering him the imperium the events of yesterday had changed the whole trend of cassius nepos's ambitions the people in its present temper was not like to accept him as the caesar even if he could persuade the praetorian guard to acclaim him as such his one desire being his own advancement and his own interests he had already realized that these were best served by the adherence to dea flavia's fortunes since the caesar himself while still in the fullness of his power had named her and her descendants as his successors for all times cassius nepos quick to seize his chance and seeing the party of patrician malcontents aimless without a leader had grasped his opportunity and constituted himself once more their organizer now whilst the others grouped themselves at a respectful distance round the augusta he stood quite close to her with his back bent and his face in the shadow augusta he began meseems that in thy heart thou hast already guessed the purpose of our coming the hour is rife and we do but wait thy command we are at one in this the praetorian guard will follow my dictates the patriciate of rome will bow the knee to thee augusta the hour is rife a raging madman a cruel mountebank and abject coward has this day forfeited all rights to sit on the throne of augustus thine immortal kinsman augusta art prepared to deliver rome finally under the heel of a tyrant and thyself to place the sceptre of augustus in the hands of one who were worthy of the prize ay my lord she asked coldly for cassius nepos had paused in his oratory ay how can i a woman decide on this great point tis for the legions to proclaim their caesar the legions he broke in quietly will follow in the wake of the praetorian guard and the praetorian guard will listen to my voice they believe that the caesar is dead they will soon believe that the will of rome lies in this and that the final choice of his successor shall rest with thee then as she made no reply but sat quite still and thoughtful her small hand shielding her face so that it was in shadow her elbows resting on the delicately carved wood of the chair cassius nepos drew a step or two nearer he bent his long back nearly double and sank his voice to an insinuating whisper it was the caesar himself o augusta he whispered who yesterday before all the people made an oath and declared that thy future lord and master should succeed to the imperium so that the descendants of immortal augustus should in time become the rulers of rome but the caesar is not dead she said simply he is dead to the people dead to his guard dead to rome asserted the praefect solemnly yesterday the dagger of Ascanis was ready to do the supreme act of retributory justice and to rid the world of a maniacal tyrant and rome of a cruel oppressor to-day the act was virtually done by the madman himself when he fled in abject terror from before the face of his people 
and as if in direct confirmation of cassius's nepos solemn words there came from far away rising momentarily above the roar of the tempest that ever persistent monotonous cry death to the caesar death even whilst jove's thunder overhead gave forth its majestic echo dea flavia no longer hid her face in her hand she sat serene and dignified upright and pure as a lily allowing her thoughts to be expressed in her blue eyes letting these ambitious self-seekers see that she was not deceived by their pretense at loyalty and patriotism they gathered closer round her and she looked now truly a queen dignified and serene her head crowned by the glory of her golden hair towering above their stooping forms there was a look of contempt in her eyes which they did not choose to see they were having their will with her they had fired her ambition and roused her enthusiasm and that was all that these intriguers asked of this girl of whom they but desired to make a tool for the carving of their selfish ends vaguely the older men wondered on whom the augustus choice had fallen whilst my lord hortensius martinus felt the hot blood rush to his cheeks at the hopes that had once more risen in his heart but now ancreus the elder began to speak and his voice was mellow and gentle the people have spoken plainly o augusta he said wilt set thy will against the might of the people of rome hath not job spoken clearly too think on the events of the past two days the caesar's pronouncement in the circus the tumult amongst the people when my lord hortensius martinus courted certain death in order to win thy favours the rage of the populace against the caesar think on it all did not jove direct all this ay but meseems that he did she murmured as her eyes fastened themselves on the heavy door that led to the inner room but since then hath he not directed the people to acclaim the caesar of their choice cassius nepos shrugged his shoulders and hortensius martinus broke in hotly the rabble clamours for the praefect of rome but the praefect is dead ay i remember my lord she said quietly there is a rumour that he died soon after he had saved thy life then as hortinus martinus feeling the sting of the rebuke bit his under lip to check an angry retort ancreus the elder rejoined suavely trying to pour the oil of his honeyed words on the troubled waters of the younger man's wrath the praefect is dead o augusta and the people will soon forget him rome deifies thee because of thy great kinsman having forgotten the hero of their choice they will readily turn to thee whom they love they will accept from thy hands the caesar whom thou wilt choose my lord hortensius after that first feeling of anger had soon recovered his serenity he tried to put an expression of sad reproach into the glance which he fixed on the augusta perhaps she had not meant to rebuke him and was already sorry that she had wounded him he would have liked to put into his glance all that he felt in his heart for her deep down within him below the overlaying crust of his ambition there was real love for the beautiful girl who had it in her power to bestow on him all the gifts for which he craved he firmly believed that the augusta reciprocated his love she had always received his admiration more patiently than that of others she had more than once listened quietly to the protestations of his love yesterday he had risked his life to win her hand she a proud roman lady was not like to forget his valour when from the arena he had caught sight of her face 
it was terror-stricken and deadly pale and she had feared for him then of that he was quite sure the horrible death which he had faced had given him the first claim to her favours in the sight of his friends they had rallied willingly round him and had tacitly recognised him as their leader now it seemed as if jove himself with the help of his thunders had ranged himself on his side he saw the glow of enthusiasm rise to dea flavia's face suffusing her eyes her lips her throat he believed that that glow had been partly kindled by his glance and was too much blinded by his own ambition and his own desires to note that the young girl's averted gaze was persistently fixed upon the door of the inner room dea flavia of a truth had little thought of my lord hortentius martinus of his ambition or of his love she could not tear her eyes away from the spot beyond the stuccoed walls where lay a man helpless now but a man whose every deed proclaimed him the born ruler of men then as those round her were silent hanging expectant upon her lips she forced her thoughts back to them and to all that they had said what would ye have me do my lords she murmured make thy choice o augusta urged cassius napos eagerly choose thy lord and master from amongst those who are ready to acclaim thy choice as final the praetorian guard is prepared i tell thee the mad caesar yesterday paved the way for our success choose thy husband augusta and the praetorian guard will forthwith proclaim him as the greatest and the best of caesars princeps imperator the father of his armies the people will go wild with joy and will deify thee and thy lord but the caesar my kinsman he will end his days in contentment and in peace said ancreus the elder dryly in a villa on the island of capreia no harm shall come to him we here present do pledge thee our oath but i must have time to think she says earnestly tis no small matter you asked of me my lords i am but a woman and still young in years and ye ask me to weigh the destinies of this mighty empire in the balance of mine own desires we would not ask it of thee o augusta were thou an ordinary mortal said hortensius martinus speaking with passionate warmth but thou art a goddess the blood of great augustus doth deify thee a goddess i she retorted coldly nay i am but a lonely woman who hath need of counsel to guide her in this supreme moment of her life are we not here to guide thee came in dulcet tones from ancreus the elder we thy faithful servants thy obedient slaves have we not spoken and counselled thee i you have spoken my lords and i have read the thoughts that lie behind your words tis not loyalty to dead augustus that alone led your footsteps to my door our love for thee interposed hortentius martinus softly and your own aims that you would follow your own ambitions that you would feed then as hot words of protest rose to the lips of most she put up her hand and added with quiet dignity nay my lords tis but human to be ambitious and rome herself is great because she is ambitious but i for myself alone have no ambition the proud title which ye would offer me hold no allurement to my tastes but if the gods will so guide my choice that a just and brave man should bear the sceptre of imperial augustus then will i thank them on my knees that i was made a medium for their will hortentius martius 
convinced that her eyes had rested on him while she spoke made an effort to disguise the look of triumph that shone from out his glance but young ascanis in whom all hope had not yet died was under the same impression as also was my lord philippus decius for in truth dea flavia had looked round on them all marvelling how any of them could compare with the man who already in her heart was the chosen lord of rome and now my lord she said paying no further heed to the sighs of restless desires that rose up round her as she spoke i pray you ask no more of me i must think and i must pray i entreat you not to urge a decision on me until i have thought and prayed time is precious augusta urged cassius nepos feebly and the people will not wait the people have fled from before the storm she rejoined and their will remember my lords may not be in accordance with yours they call for the praefect of rome and the praefect is dead we must be ready to acclaim a caesar who will be equally to their choice then she said when to-morrow the third hour of the day is called i pray you my lords come back to me for mine answer but i must have until to-morrow to ponder and to pray and you must press me now she added decisively seeing that protestations were again hanging on their lips then must my answer be no to all your demands though in her heart she had already weighed all that she meant to do yet she would not give her decision without speaking first to the man who already was the elect of her choice he was sick now lying in the arms of sleep in a few hours probably he would be refreshed and it would be indeed be a mighty caesar whom she would proclaim on the morrow before the people of rome the people will not wait till to-morrow augusta urged ancreas the elder canst tell a raging tempest to pause or a thunderstorm to bide thy time they are quiet for the nonce but in an hour they will again invade the imperial hill the house will not be safe then must ye put a check upon the people as best ye can my lords i cannot make my choice at this hour she said determinedly if you cannot wait and if you fear the people then you must make your plans without my help they consulted with one another in whispers the augusta was obdurate and without her they did not care to act her personality was alone powerful enough at this crisis to satisfy the people and she alone could stand for the success of their intrigues against the people's loud demands for the praefect of rome betwixt the two dangers the plotters chose the lesser one if the populace got once more out of hand they would whilst invading the palaces find the caesar and no doubt murder him the act of vengeance once accomplished they would probably calm down for a while they would expend their strength in clamouring for the praefect of rome but the praefect of rome was certainly dead else he would have appeared ere this the darkness of the night would perforce put a stop to all street rioting under its cover the praetorian praefect could easily rejoin the guard and by the third hour of to-morrow everything would be prepared for the proclamation of the newly chosen caesar not one of these conspirators had any doubt as to who that caesar would be chosen from among their ranks he would be compelled to reward richly those who had placed them on the throne dea flavia waited quietly while these hurried consultations were going on now that she saw that her wishes had prevailed she once more became gracious and kind with a sign of the head and a smile that contained a promise she intimated to them that they were dismissed i beg of you my lords she said to look upon my house as your own until the morrow my slaves will offer you food and drink and prepare you baths to refresh you and sleeping chambers for the night 
to-morrow you will have mine answer may the gods protect ye until then my lords she touched a small gong summoning dion and nolus back into her presence to them she entrusted the task of seeing to the needs of these great lords and of watching over their comforts it would have been churlish and inexpedient after this to insist on further conversation moreover the presence of the slaves put a check on the privacy it was better on the whole to obey these sybarites too were not averse to the thought of a rich table and of merry-making in the augusta house until the morrow her cooks were noted for their skill and hers with the richest cellars in rome cassius nepos ancreus the elder and the others all walked out of dea flavia's presence backwards and with the spine bent at an obsequious angle hortensius martinus was the last to leave he knelt on the floor and taking the edge of her tunic between his fingers he touched it reverently with his lips she looked down on him not unkindly had he but known that his greatest claim on her graciousness was that his life had been saved by another he would not have worn that look of triumph as he finally followed the others out of the room she hath made her choice my lord said cassius nepos amiably taking the younger man by the arm a woman was not like to reject such brilliant proposals i will ask for the prefecture of rome murmured ancreus the elder complacently my lord hortensius martinus said nothing but he disengaged his arms from his too familiar friend and walked ahead of all the others squaring his shoulders and holding his head erect as one already marked out to rule over the rest of mankind End of chapter twenty nine Chapter Thirty of Unto Caesar by Baroness Auxey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea. Chapter Thirty. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. Saint Matthew seven verse fourteen. In the studio, upon the throne-like chair of carved citrus wood and heavy crimson silk dea flavia sat silent and alone the footsteps of the men quickly died away on the marble floors of the atrium their harsh voices and loud laughter only reached this secluded spot as a faint and tangible echo the patter of rain from above into the impluvium was soothing in its insistent monotony only from time to time jove still angered sent his thunders rolling through the heavy clouds and his lightnings rending the lurid sky the people of Rome, wrathful against the Caesar, vaguely demanding vengeance for wrongs unstated, had not gone to rest. Like the gale a while ago, they had merely drawn back in their fury, quiescent for a while, but losing neither strength nor temerity. Dull cries still resounded from afar. Death to the Caesar was still the rallying cry, though it came now subdued by distance, and the majestic screens of stately temples interposed between it and the towering heights of the imperial palatine dear flavia at first her musings one wild tangle of hopes fears and joys did only vaguely listen for each recurrent cry as it came and thus listening and watching her ears became doubly sensitive and acute and caught the words more distinctly as they rolled in the currents of the wind that blew them upwards from the arcades of the forum death to the caesar that cry was always clear and with it came, like a compliment, or a corollary, the name of the prefect of Rome. Hail, Taurus Antinor Caesar! Hail! The cry filled Dea Flavia's veins as with living fire. She longed to run out into the streets now, at this moment, with the rain beating about her and a storm raging overhead, and to call to the people to come into her house, in their thousands and tens of thousands, and here to fall down and worship the mighty hero who would rule over them all. The people clamoured for him, and because of these clamours an almighty love for the people of Rome filled the heart of the Augusta. She saw now just what the Imperium should be, just how supreme power should sit upon a man, and she loved the people because the people saw it too. 
they clamoured for the one man who would fulfil every ideal of Caesarship and of might. Valour yesterday, the sublimity of self-sacrifice, had appealed to them with irresistible force, even though they did not understand the force that had set these great virtues in motion. The hero of yesterday should be the chosen of today, the god of tomorrow. Let the brutish Caesar be swept from before his path. The people clamoured, and did they see the prefect of Rome standing virile and powerful before them, they would fall on their knees and acclaim him princeps, imprator, greater than the great Augustus himself. And in this very house, but a few steps from where Dea sat musing, were the men, the patricians, who were ready to accept the decision of the people, who were all powerful to make the legions acknowledge the new Caesar, and ready to set the seal of official acceptance to the wild desires of the plebes. The patriciate of Rome had combined with the people to place its destinies in Dea Flavia's hands. The Caesar's insane pronouncement at the circus yesterday had confirmed the wishes of the conspirators. All envies and jealousies would best be set at rest if the kinswoman of great Augustus chose the future Caesar and secured the inheritance of the great emperor for his descendants later on. And now there was but her choice to be made and the Imperium would descend on the noblest head that had ever worn a crown. Dea Flavia felt the hot blood rush to her cheeks at the thought that the choice did rest with her, that the man who was so proud, so self-absorbed, so self-willed but a few days ago in the Forum, would receive supreme gifts through her, that he would be the recipient, and she, like the goddess, holding riches, power, honour in her hands, that she would shower them on him while he knelt, a suppliant first, then a grateful worshipper at her feet. Ambitious. He must be ambitious. Ambition was the supreme virtue of the Rome patrician, and she had it in her power to satisfy the wildest cravings of ambition in the one man above all men whom she felt was worthy of the gifts. Those were the first thoughts that merged themselves into a coherent whole in Dea Flavia's head after Caius Nepos and others had bowed themselves from out her presence. And there was her sense of the power of giving, that sense so dear to a woman's heart. As to the thought of love, of the marriage which this same choice of hers would entail, of that greatest gift of all, herself, which by her choice she would promise him, that thought did not even begin to enter her head. She was so much a girl still, hardly yet a woman. She had thought so little hitherto, felt so little, lived so little. A semi-deified Augusta, surrounded by obsequious slaves and sycophantic hangers-on she had existed in her proud way aloof from the bent backs that surrounded her loyal to the caesar loyal to herself and to her house but she had not lived there had never been a desire within her that had not been gratified or that had grown delicious and intense through being thwarted she had never suffered never hoped never feared the world was there as a plaything she had seen masks, but never faces. She had never looked into a human heart, or witnessed human sorrow or joy. Looking back upon her life, dear Flavia saw how senseless, how soulless it had been. Her soul awakened that day in the Forum, when first a real living man was revealed to her. Not a puppet, not a mealy-mouthed sycophant, not a torturous self-seeker, just a man with a heart, a will, a temperament, and strange memories of things seen of which he had told her, though he saw that he angered her. Since then she had begun to live, to realise that men lived, thought and felt, that they had other desires but those of pleasing the Caesar, or winning his good graces. She had seen a man offering his life to save another's. She had seen him clinging to a strange symbol which seemed to bring peace to his heart. That man she honoured, and on him would rest her choice, and he would be exalted above everyone on earth, because she believed him to be loyal and just, and knew him to be brave. Her own heart, still in its infancy, had not realised that her choice would rest on that man, not because of his virtues, not because of his courage and his power, but for the simple sublime womanly reason that he was the man whom she loved. And as she sat there, musing and still, with her eyes almost involuntarily drawn toward the oaken door of the inner room, she saw it slowly swinging out upon its hinges. She heard the swishing of the heavy curtain behind it, and the next moment she saw the prefect of Rome 
standing on the threshold. He looked sick and wan, but strangely tall and splendid in the barbaric pomp of the gorgeous robe which he had worn yesterday. Dion had cleaned it of blood and dust, and it still looked crumpled and stained, but as he came forward the purple and gold gleamed against the stuccoed walls of the studio, and his tawny hair and sun-tanned face looked dark in the subdued light. She could see plainly through the robe, the line of bandages which bound his lacerated shoulders, and her heart was filled with pity for all that he had suffered, and with pride at the thought of all the joys that would come to him through her. As he came nearer to her, he bent the knee. "'I crave leave to kiss thy feet,' he said, "'for thy graciousness to me.' "'Thou art well, O Taurus Antinor,' she asked timidly. "'Thy wounds are healed, O gracious lady,' he broke in gently, whilst a smile lit up his dark face, "'since thy lips did deign to ask after them.' "'It was presumptuous of me to bring thee here,' she said after a while. I feared that thou wast dead, and the Caesar would have defiled my body. Then would I kiss the ground where the hem of thy gown did touch it, for thy graciousness hath made it sacred. I pray thee rise, she said, thou art weak. May I not kneel? Not to me, not to thee, but before thee, Augusta, before thy beauty and thy purity, the exquisite creations of God, of thy God. O Taurus Antinor, she said with a little sigh, he hath naught to do with me. He made thee for man's delight, to gladden the heart of those on whom thy glance doth rest. She had ordered him to sit on a pile of cushions, which lay not far from her chair. Thus he was almost at her feet, and she could look down upon his massive shoulders, and on his head bent slightly forward as he spoke. She thought then how like unto a ruler of men he was, how much strength and power did his whole person express. She wondered with a happy little feeling of anticipation how he would take the news which she would impart to him, what he would say, how he would look when he knew that she was prepared to crown him with the diadem of Augustus, and to bestow on him the full gifts of her love. Time was precious, and the next few moments would satisfy her wonderment. She longed to see the fire of ambition light up his earnest face, the glow of love smouldering in his eyes would render their glance exquisitely sweet. But for the moment, she would have liked to put the more serious issues off for a while. She would have liked to sit here for many hours to come, with him close by at her feet, her ears pleasantly tickled by his gentle words of bold admiration, yet profound respect. Had he not said that she was made to gladden the heart of those on whom her glance did rest? And a sense of sadness had crept into her heart as he thus spoke for memory had conjured up before her mind the miseries which had followed in her wake these few days past. "'I have brought naught but misery,' she said with a sigh, "'to those whom I would bless.' "'Joy to me, Augusta,' he rejoined earnestly, "'since the day I first beheld thee.' "'Menecrita is dead,' she whispered. "'Dost remember?' "'I remember,' she paused a while, then said abruptly, and the Caesar is a fugitive. Heavens above! he exclaimed, and the whole expression of his face changed suddenly. A fugitive? When? Where? The people are wrathful against him, she said. They surrounded his palace, and even... The words died on her lips. The shout of, Death to the Caesar, death! had come distinctly from afar. He jumped to his feet, and she saw that his face now looked careworn and anxious. "'Where is the Caesar?' he asked hurriedly. "'He is a fugitive, I tell thee. "'The rabble fired his palace to force him to come out of it and face them. "'But he ran away through the secret passage "'which leads through the house of Germanicus to mine. "'He is here, then?' "'No. "'He grovelled at my feet and begged me to hide him, "'here, in my private chamber where he thought he would be safe. "'But I would not let him come, "'for I thought thee helpless in thy bed "'and feared that he would kill thee.' Great God! Nay, why shouldst thou call to thy God on behalf of a tyrant and a coward? She said excitedly. Thou shouldst have seen that man cowering at my feet like a beaten dog. I could have spurned him with my foot, as I would a cur. The Caesar, Augusta, the Caesar! Aye, she rejoined firmly. The Caesar, my kinsman, 
Were he not that, I would have rushed to my door and called to the people, and would have handed over unto them that miserable bundle of rags, which stood for the majesty of Caesar. And I lay a helpless log, he rejoined bitterly, while the destinies of Rome lay in thy hands. I, the destinies of Rome, she said proudly, whilst a glow of intense excitement filled her whole personality. But not in my hands, O prefect, but in thine. In mine. She rose and went up to him, and placed her white fingers upon his arm. Listen, she said. She held up her other hand, and thus stood beside him with slender neck stretched slightly forward, her lips parted, a look of intentness expressed in the whole of her exquisite face. A dost here, she whispered. Obedient to her will, he listened too. The cry of, Death to the Caesar, monotonous and weird, seemed to strike him with horror, for his worn cheeks assumed a yet paler hue, and his lips murmured words which, however, she could not understand. Then suddenly the cry was followed by another, indistinct at first, yet gaining in clearness as it rose on the waves of the storm from the forum below. The Prefect of Rome! Where is the Prefect of Rome? Hail, Taurus Antinor Caesar, hail! Hark! she said triumphantly. Dost hear? The people call to thee. They are ready to deify thee. They call for thee. Dost hear them, O Prefect? But though she turned her eager questioning gaze on him, though excitement and enthusiasm seemed to emanate from her from every pore, the look of horror only deepened on his face, and the whispered prayer did not cease to tremble on his lips. Dost hear them? she reiterated once more. He was looking on her now, and gradually horror faded from his eyes, and pallor from his cheeks. A wave of tenderness seemed to pass right over his face, making the harsh lines seem marvellously soft. "'I hear thy voice,' he murmured, "'soft as the breath of spring among the leaves of roses. "'Thy people call for thee, and thy hand is on my arm, "'and I feel the magic of thy touch.' She stood there, quite close to him, tall and slender, like those lilies which, ever since he first beheld her, had so sweetly reminded him of her. Her simple grey tunic fell in straight folds from her shoulders. Not a single jewel adorned her hands or neck. Only her hair, in heavy plaits, made a crown of gold above her brow. Never had she seemed to him so beautiful as now, for never had she seemed so womanly, and yet so young. Her soul, rising triumphant from its trammels of high rank, an artificial living, emerged godlike, opening out to the advent of love, welcoming it as it came, enfolding it in its own ardour and in its purity. With this man's presence near her, with her hand upon his arm, she had suddenly understood. Ambition, power, dominion of the world had vanished from her thoughts. She had found love, knew love, felt its empire and its yoke, and the vista which that knowledge opened up before her was more wonderful than she could ever have dreamed of before. Her cheeks were glowing with enthusiasm, her lips were parted and her eyes were of a vivid translucent blue, with the pupils like brilliant sardonyx, full of dark and mysterious lights. She was ready to meet love with a surfeit of the rich gifts which she had at her command. Thy people call to thee, Taurus Antinor, she reiterated eagerly. They want a man to lead them. They are tired of tyranny, of bloodshed, of idleness. They want to live. Therefore, they call to thee. Two hundred thousand hearts were opened to thee yesterday in the amphitheatre. Two hundred thousand tongues acclaimed thee even as in thine arms thou didst hold my lord Hortensius Martius, and didst bear him to safety. The people have need of thee, and are ready to follow thee whithersoever thou wouldst lead them. They are miserable and oppressed. They want justice. They are starving and want bread. Their fate is in thy keeping, for thou wouldst give them justice, and thou wouldst feed the poor and clothe the needy. All this morning did I hear the moans of the downtrodden, the wretched and the weak, and felt that Rome could only find happiness now through thee. And the Caesar, he said, where is the Caesar? He hath fled like a coward. Let him be forgotten even whilst the people proclaim thee the Caesar, and a new era of happiness doth rise over Rome. Then, as he made no reply, she continued more hurriedly, more insistently. 
There are those in my house now who would be the first to acclaim thee as the Caesar. The Praetorian Guard, fired by thy valour yesterday, sickened by the cowardice of Caligula, is ready to follow in their wake, whilst mine will be the joy of calling unto the whole city of Rome, Citizens, behold your Caesar, he is here! She would not tell him that the Imperium should come to him only through her hands. A strange reticence seemed to choke these words in her throat. Anon he would know. Caius Nepus and the others would tell him. But it was so sweet to give so much, and, as the giver, to remain unknown. She made a quick movement now, half withdrawing her hand from his arm. But his firm grasp closed swiftly over it. No, no, he said. Take not thy touch from off my soul lest I sink into an abyss of degradation. He kept her slender fingers riveted against his arm, and she looked up at him a little frightened, for his words sounded strange, and there was a wild look in his eyes. She remembered suddenly that he was sick, and that a brief while ago fever had fired his brain. All her womanly tenderness surged up at the sight of his drawn face. "'Thou art ill,' she said gently. He fell on his knees, and still holding a hand, he rested his forehead against the cool white fingers. "'I am dying,' he said softly, "'for love of thee.' There was silence in the room now, whilst she stood quite still, like a grey bird in its nest. She was looking down on him, and his head was bowed upon her hands. A weird, ruddy light penetrated into the studio from above, and the sound of the pattering rain awoke a soft, murmuring echo on the white walls. The noise of strife and rebellion— though distant, still filled the air around. But here, in this room, there was infinite quietude and peace. Dear Flavia felt supremely happy. Love had come to her in its most exquisite plenitude. The man whom she honoured loved her, and she loved him. It seemed as if she had slept for thousands and thousands of years, and had just woken up to see how beautiful was the world. "'Love is not death,' she murmured gently. "'It is life.' "'Death to me,' he whispered, "'for I have seen thy beauty, "'and felt thee near unto my soul, "'and when I no longer may look upon thee, "'my eyes will become blind "'with the infinity of their longing, "'and when I no longer can feel thy touch, "'my heart will become a stone.' "'A quick blush rose to her cheeks. "'That time shall never come, Taurus Antinor,' "'she said so softly "'that her words hardly reached his ears. "'Have I not told thee?' that there are those in my house who are ready to acclaim thee as the Caesar, acting upon my kinsman's own pronouncement yesterday. They have come to me, to beg me to make the choice which will place the Imperium in the hands of the man most worthy to wield it. My choice is made, O prefect. Look into mine eyes, my dear lord, and read what they express. He looked up just as she bade him, and as he did so there fell on him from her blue eyes such a look of love, that with a wild cry of passionate joy he stretched out his arms and closed them around her. "'Love is not death, dear lord,' she murmured, even as the tears gathered in her eyes and made them shine like stars. The moment was too supreme for words. Even the whisper, "'I love thee,' died upon their lips. He held her close to him, her dear head resting on his shoulder, his hand upon her cheek, the perfume of her loveliness mounting to his nostrils and making his senses real, with its exquisite fragrance. This one great moment was love's, and it was love's alone. Each had forgotten strife, rebellion, ambition, the fugitive Caesar and the murmuring people. Each only remembered the other, and the perfect flavour of that first lingering kiss. Whatever life held for them hereafter, glory or shame, joy or regret, this moment remained unspoiled, perfect in its ecstasy, the world but a dream, Love, the only reality. Overhead the thunder rolled at intervals, dull and distant now, with occasional flashes of vivid lightning, which lit up Dia's golden hair and the round bare shoulder which emerged above the tunic. Her face was in shadow. She lay against his heart like a young bird that has found its nest. Then he awoke from this ecstasy. "'The Caesar!' he said wildly. "'Where is the Caesar?' "'Hear me now, dear lord.' she murmured, looking up at him with a smile. My head is on his shoulder, and I can hear the beating of his heart. The Caesar Augusta, he said more insistently, and now he held her away from him, her two hands still in his, and held against his breast, but she at an arm's length from him. Augusta, he reiterated, I implore thee, 
Where is the Caesar? Hid in the palace of Augustus, whining like a coward for his vanished power. Forget him, my dear lord, he is not worthy of thy thoughts. Whither art going? she added suddenly, for with gentle force he had disengaged his hands from hers, and had turned toward the door. To the Caesar, dear heart, he said simply. And he is a fugitive, he hath need of friends, and he is afraid, he hath need of courage. Thou'lt not go to him, dear lord, she exclaimed indignantly, and her hands, strong and firm, fastened themselves on his arm. A coward, I tell thee, a madman, a tyrant. The Caesar Augusta, he retorted, deign to let me go to him. Thou'rt mad, Taurus Antinor. Fever is in thy veins, and doth cloud the clearness of thy brain. Hast not heard the people, they vow vengeance on him. Tis on thee they call. Thou art their chosen, their appointed. The people call to thee. It is thou whom they acclaim. Tomorrow, he said more gently, they will have forgotten their disloyalty. Tomorrow they will have forgotten me. They think me dead. Dead I will be to them tomorrow. Nay, but today, she urged, today is thine and mine. The Praetorian Prefect is here, and the others. The choice rests with me, and my choice is made. Rome even now rings from end to end with thy name. Hail, Taurus Antinor Caesar, hail! Hast no ambition, she cried, for at her words he had remained cold and still. None, he replied gently, but so to help the Caesar, that he may gain the love of his people by acts of grace and mercy, and to see the wings of peace once more spread over the seven hills of Rome. With a firm yet exquisitely tender touch, he took her clinging hands in his, forcing her to release her grip on his arm. On her trembling fingers he pressed a burning, lingering kiss. "'Thou art not going!' she cried. "'To the Caesar, O my soul! He hath need of me. He has mine oath. My loyalty is his. A madman and a tyrant. If thou goest to him, he will kill thee. His guard is with him. He will kill thee! That is as God wills.' "'Thy God!' she retorted vehemently. "'Thy God! Doth he wish to part us?' Is my love not that he should wish thee to spurn it? The value of thy love is infinite, he said earnestly and tenderly, as, in perfect humility, he bent the knee for one moment before her, and, stooping to the very ground, he kissed the tip of her sandal. Tis only on bended knees that such as I can render sufficient thanks to God, and to thee for that holy, precious gift. She bent down to him, and said with earnest solemnity, Then I entreat thee, Good, my lord, in the name of that love, go not now to the Caesar, and he doth not kill thee. And thou dost help to bring him back to power, he will use that power to part thee from me. Do not go from me now, dear lord. If thou goest, I know that it will be for ever. The Caesar hates thee now as much as he loved thee before. His hatred is as insensate as his love, and he will kill thee or take thee from me. In either case, tis death, my good lord." "'Twere death to betray the Caesar, O my soul,' he replied, still on his knees, his forehead bent low to the ground. "'Death, a thousand times worse than a dagger's thrust, a thousand times worse than parting.' His voice was low and vibrant, and as his solemn words died away, they struck the murmuring echo that slumbered on the studio walls. And Dea Flavia was silent now, silent as he rose to his feet and stood before her with head slightly bent. Silent, because borne on the subtle wing of that same dying echo, there came to her the awful sense of unavoidable fate. She shuddered, as if with cold. That sense of fatality seemed ready to spread over her soul like a pall. It was only the Roman blood in her, the blood of victorious Augustus, which would not allow her to yield to the spectre. Not just yet, not until the last battle had been fought, the last unconquerable weapon drawn. She waited in silence for a while nor did she detain him by the slightest gesture, although he once more made a movement as if to go. Only her eyes rooted him to the spot, even as she said very softly, her voice sounding full and mellow like the cooing of a dove. My lord, I entreat thee but to grant me one moment longer, for of a truth there is much that my mind cannot grasp. Of thy God we will not speak, whoever he be, 
as thou dost worship him, I will be content to worship by thy side. But that will come in the fullness of time. Dost love me, my dear Lord? With every aspiration of my soul, with every beating of my heart, with every fibre of my body do I love thee, he said, and there was such intensity of passion in his voice, such a glowing ardour in the glance which seemed to envelop and embrace her whole person, that even she, the proud Augusta, the woman, exacting through the very magnitude of her love, was satisfied. Then, dear Lord, I entreat thee, she said, for one brief moment only think of naught but of our love. Let me rest in thine arms but that one moment longer, and remember the while that with my love the world conquered will lie at thy feet. She drew closer to him, and once more lay against his breast. She was tender and clinging now, no longer the Augusta, the unapproachable princess, but just a woman, loving and submissive, proud to give and proud to abdicate. To him this was the torturing moment. He knew what she desired, and what weapons she could wield wherewith to subdue his will. The battle he fought with himself just then was but a precursor of the fiercer one which anon he would have to fight against her. The rending of his soul was expressed in every line of his face, which once more now looked haggard and harsh. Dea Flavia saw it all. She saw how he suffered, whilst with every passing second the inward struggle became more difficult and fierce. His breath came and went with feverish rapidity. The frown across his brow deepened visibly, and for a while his arms were rigid and his fists clenched, even though she clung to him, her frail body against his, her head upon his breast. "'Thou wouldst lose the world and lose me,' she murmured. "'The world is at thy feet, and I love thee.' A moan escaped him as that of a wounded creature in pain. The rigidity of his arms relaxed, and wildly now he was pressing her closer to him. "'I love thee,' he murmured. "'I love thee. The world is well lost to me now that I have held thee in my arms.' "'The world, dear Lord,' she whispered, "'is not lost. R rather it is one. My hand and thine will make that world a happier and brighter one. Power is thine. Thou art the Caesar. Hush, sh, sh, idol of my soul. Do not speak of that, not now, when my arms are round thee and the whole world has vanished from my ken. Let me live in my dream just a brief moment longer. Let me forget all save my love for thee.' It hath burned my soul for an eternity, meseems, for I have only lived since that hour when first I heard thy voice. In the forum, dost remember, when I knelt at thy feet and tied the strings of thy shoe. I remember! And I loved thee from that hour. I loved thee for thy purity, because thou art exquisitely beautiful, and I am a man thirsting for happiness. But God, who hath need of my soul, hath willed to break my heart so that I might remain pure and true to his service. It was so filled with thine image that even the glorious vision of his passion became faint and dim. But with infinite pity he hath given thee to me just for this one brief glorious hour that it might feed on the memory of thee even whilst my feet trod the way that leads to the foot of his cross. There is but one way, dear Lord, she exclaimed, for thy footsteps to tread. "'Tis the way that leads to my arms first, "'and thence upwards to the temple of Jupiter Victor, "'where stands the throne and rests the sceptre of Augustus. "'The way of which I speak, dear heart,' he rejoined earnestly, "'also leads upwards, upwards to Calvary, "'on the uttermost summit of which stands a lonely, broken cross. "'The wind and rains and snows of the past seven years "'have worked their will with it. "'They tell me that one of its branches lies broken on the ground.' that its stem is split from end to end. But it is there, there still, abandoned now and alone, but to eyes that can see still bearing the imprint of the heavenly body that hung thereon for three hours in unspeakable agony, so that men might know how to live and might learn how to die. She said nothing for the moment. Her excitement had not left her. Her lips were mute because that which was in her heart was too great, too strange for words. She did not understand what he meant. She thought that fever had clouded his brain. Anon, she felt sure, sane reason would return, and with it ambition, which became every man. 
but she did not understand that his love for her transcended all human love that she ever wot of. It was great and noble and sublime as all that emanated from him, and womanlike, she was content to let other matters shape themselves in accordance with the will of the gods. She looked into the face which in this brief period of time she had learnt to love, and tried to read that which to her was still hidden behind the earnest brow and the deep-set eyes. In them, indeed, did she read exultation, an ardour at least equal to her own, but an ardour for an object which she, the proud, exquisite pagan, the daughter of Augustus, wholly failed to comprehend. She had shown him the way to the Imperium, to the diadem of Augustus, the sceptre of the Caesars, yet in his eyes, which were unfathomable and blue as the ocean that girt his own ancestral home of far away, there glowed neither the fire of ambition nor the desire for supreme power, only the fire of love for her and the serenity of infinite peace. Dear Lord, she said, when the sceptre of Augustus is in thine hands, thou canst wield it at thy pleasure. I know not the way of which thou speakest. The mountain of Calvary is unknown to me, and thou speakest of things that are strange to mine ear. But the gods have placed it within my power to make thee great above all men, the ruler of the mightiest empire in the world, and on my knees do I thank them that they have shown me the way whereby I can guide thy footsteps even to the throne of Augustus. And on my knees do I thank God, O my soul, that thou didst show me the way to the foot of his cross. God himself, dear heart, oh, thou'lt understand some day, for thy soul is beautiful, and prepared to receive just that one breath from heaven which will show it the way to eternal life. God himself, dear heart, who lived amongst us all a lowly, humble life of patience and of toil. God, think on it. Who might have come down to us in the fullness of his majesty? Who might, had he so chosen, have wielded the sceptre of the world and worn every crown of every empire throughout the ages? But whom I saw, I, I, dear heart, saw it with mine own eyes as he toiled, weary and foot-sore, a hungered and thirst, that he might comfort the poor, and that he might comfort the poor, and bring radiance unto the dwellings of the humble. And I, who saw him thus, I, who heard his voice of gentleness and of peace, I, to desire a crown and a sceptre, to betray the Caesar and to mount a throne. Dear heart, dear heart, dost not understand that the sceptre would weigh like lead in my hands, and the crown bow my head down with shame? Then would my whispered words lift the weight from thy brow, and my kiss dissipate the blush of shame from thy cheeks. Day and night would go by in infinite happiness, thy head upon my breast, mine arms encircling thy neck. I am ignorant still, yet would I teach thee what love means, and the sweet lesson learnt from me thou wouldst teach me in return. And in mine ear the still, small voice would murmur, Thou hast seen the living face of thy God. Didst break thine oath to Caesar. Thou didst betray him in his need, even as the Iscariot betrayed his Lord with a kiss. The voice of thy God, she retorted, is no louder than that of the people of Rome, and the people proclaim thee the Caesar, and have released thee of thine oath. The voice of God, he said slowly, spoke to me across the sandy wastes of Galilee, and said unto me, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. His softly murmured words died away in the vastness around him. Dear Flavia made no response, a terrible ache was in her heart, as if a cold, dead hand gripped its every string, whilst mocking laughter sounded in her ear. That cruel monster, Finality, grinned at her from across the room. Love was lying bleeding and fettered at the feet of some intangible, superhuman spectre, which dear Flavia dreaded, because it was the unknown. Taurus Antinor's eyes were fixed into vacancy, and she trembled because she could not see that which he saw. Was he looking on that very vision which he had conjured up, a cross, broken and tempest-tossed, a symbol of that power which to him was mightier than the empire of Rome, mightier than the kingdom of her love? She remembered how, a few days ago, in this self-same room, she had in thought accosted and defied that Galilean rebel who had died the ignominious death. She had defied him, even she, 
dear Flavia Augusta of the imperial house of Caesar, she had offered him battle for this very man whose soul she now would fill with her own. She had defied the Galilean, vowed that she would conquer this heart and filch it from the allegiance it had sworn, vowed that she would make it Caesar's first and then her own, that she would break it and crush it first and then wrest it from its unknown god. And now it seemed as if that obscure Galilean rebel had conquered in the end. She had brought forth the whole armoury of her love, her beauty, her nearness, the ardour of youth and passion which emanated from her entire being, and the intangible unknown had remained the victor, and she was left with that awful ache in her heart which was more bitter than death. "'Have I thy leave to go, Augusta?' he asked gently at last. "'The moments are precious. The Caesar hath need of me.' She woke as from a hideous dream. With a wild gesture of the arm she seemed to sweep away from before her those awful spectres that assailed her. Then she clung to him with the strength of oncoming despair. "'No, no!' she cried. "'Do not go. He will kill thee. I say, do not go!' "'I must,' he said firmly. "'Dear heart, I entreat thee, let me go. "'No, no, think but a moment. Think, my love. Is it not to thee? "'Had my kiss left thee cold? "'Do not leave me, dear Lord. Do not leave me yet. "'Not just yet. Now that I know what happiness can mean, "'I have been so lonely all my life. "'Love hath come to me at last. Love and happiness. "'I am young. I want both. Dear Lord, if thou lovest me, canst leave me desolate. If I love thee. There was so much longing in the one brief phrase, such passion and such tenderness, that all her hopes revived. One more effort and she felt sure that she would conquer. Fever was in her veins now. The walls of the studio swam before her eyes. She fell on her knees, for she could no longer stand. But her arms encircled him, clinging to him with all her might. Her face lifted up to his was swimming in tears. Her golden hair escaping from its trammels fell in a glowing mass down her shoulders. "'I love thee,' she murmured. "'Canst leave me now, dear Lord. If thou goest now, tis forever. Think, oh, think, just for one moment. The Caesar restored to power will part me from thee, even if anon in his madness he doth not kill thee. If thou goest, tis for ever. Think on it, think on it ere thou goest. My love, my love, go not from me, and leave me desolate. Dear Lord, but think on it, of the kisses thou wilt taste from my lips, the ecstasies thou wilt find in my arms. Thine am I, thine my heart that loves thee, my body that worships thee, every thought is thine, go not from me, not just now, till thou hast felt once more the full savour of my love. Her arms round his knees, and she was exquisitely beautiful. Exquisite in a whole-hearted love, her whole-hearted abnegation. She, a proud Roman lady, kneeling at his feet, her full red lips asking for a kiss. He stood with his face buried in his hands. Oh, my God, my God, he murmured. Do not forsake me now. The thunder crashed overhead while a human soul fought its desperate fight for truth and eternal life. A vivid flash of lightning lit up the whitewashed walls of the studio, and to the poor fighting soul, tortured with temptation, with longing, and with passion, there came in that swift bright flash a vision of long ago. The sky, lurid and dark, the soil, the soil trembling beneath the feet of thousands of men and women, and there, far away, outlined against that sky, a figure stretched out upon a cross. The head was bent in agony, the eyes half-closed, the lips livid and parted. The body broken with torments had the rigidity of death, but the arms were stretched out, straight and wide, as if with one last gesture of appeal and of longing, and in this storm-laden air there floated tender words, intangible and soft as a memory. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. It was but a vision, swift as the lightning flash that conjured it, and the words had already died on the stillness of the air. But the tortured soul had found its anchorage. Taurus Antinor's hands fell from before his face. In thy service, O Jesus of Galilee, he said, and the mighty effort of subjection brought the perspiration to his brow and caused his limbs to tremble. I saw thine agony, thy sacrifice. It should be so easy to do this for thy sake. 
give me the strength to render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and do thou take from me all that is thine. She heard his words, she saw the look, and knew that she had failed. Back on the cruel wings of remembrance came the words of Anacrata the slave. May thine every deed of mercy be turned to sorrow and to humiliation. Thine every act of pity prove a curse to him who receives it, until thou on thy knees art left to sue for pity to a heart that knoweth it not, and findest a deaf ear turned unto thy cry. And the curse of the broken-hearted mother seemed like the tangible response to the defiance which she, in her arrogance and her pride, had hurled against him who was called Jesus of Nazareth. She would have blessed Menacrita, and Menacrita was dead. She would have given her life for the Caesar, and the Caesar was a cowardly fugitive. And now on her knees she had sued for pity, and the heart which she had fought for to possess had turned from her as if it knew neither mercy nor love. And whilst her very soul had cried with longing, she had found a deaf ear, turned to her cry. That unknown Galilean who died upon the cross had been stronger than her love. It was he who was filching it from its allegiance, he who was brushing and crushing this heart ere he wrested it finally from her. Dear Flavia Augusta of the imperial house of Caesar. The Galilean had accepted her challenge, and he had conquered and she was not in the heart of the one man she would have given her whole life to call her own. She gave a cry like a wounded bird. She jumped to her feet and for one moment stood up, splendid, wrathful, pagan to the heart. "'Curse thy God!' she cried wildly. "'Curse him, I say, for a jealous, cruel God! Go thy ways, O follower of the Galilean, go thy ways, and when lonely and wretched thy footsteps lead thee along that way which thou hast deified, then call on him, I say, thou'lt find him silent to thy prayer, and deaf unto thy woe. Her body swayed, an ashen pallor spread over her cheeks. She would have fallen backwards like a log, had he not caught her in his arms. Reverently he carried her to the couch, and there he laid her down wrapping her grey shroud-like tunic closely round her feet. He bent over her and kissed her golden hair, each blue-veined lid closed in unconsciousness, the perfect lips pallid now and still. In the name of him who died before my eyes, take her in thy keeping, O oh God, he murmured fervently. Then, without another glance on her, he fled precipitately from the room. End of chapter 30 To beg me to make the choice which will place the Imperium in the hands of the man most worthy to wield it. My choice is made, O Prefect. Look into mine eyes, my dear Lord, and read what they express. Chapter 31 of Unto Caesar This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Unto Caesar by Baroness Orczy. Chapter 31. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Ephesians 6.13 Without looking to right or left, he strode across the atrium. A cloak, quickly, he commanded, as Dion and Nolus, obedient and expectant of orders, rushed forward at his approach. From the triclinium on the right came the sound of loud laughter and the strains of a bibulous song. Voices raised in gaiety and pleasure. Taurus Antinor recognized that of Caius Nepos, fluent and mellow, and that of my lord Hortensius Martius, resonant and clear. To what their revelries meant he did not give a thought. Dia had told him why these men had come to her house. The intrigues hatched two days ago over a supper-table were finding their culmination now. The Caesar was a fugitive, and the people rebellious. The golden opportunity lay ready to the hand of these treacherous self-seekers, and Dia Flavia 
was to be their tool their puppet until such time as they betrayed her in her turn into other hands that paid them higher wage taurus antinor wrapped the dark cloak which dion had brought him closely around his person he gave the slaves a mute peremptory sign of silence and then quickly walked past the janitors through the vestibule and out into the open street the midday light had yielded to early afternoon it still was gray and lurid with a leaden mist hanging over the distance and moisture rising up from the rain-sodden ground the worst of the storm had passed from over the city but the thunder still rolled dully at intervals above the campania and great gusts of wind drove the heavy rain into taurus antinor's face it seemed to him as he walked rapidly down the narrow street in front of the augusta's palace that the noise from the forum below had gained in volume and in strength when the raging tempest of rebellion was at its height earlier in the day he had lain in a drug sleep unconscious of the shouts the threats the groans which had resounded from palace to palace on the very summit of the palatine when he awoke these terrifying sounds were already more subdued the people had been driven by the storm-fanned conflagration which they themselves had kindled to seek shelter under the arcades of the taberna in the forum below but now after a couple of hours of enforced inactivity they were ready once more for mischief in compact groups of a dozen or so they were slowly emerging from beneath the shelters it only needed the amalgamation of these isolated groups for the fire of open insurrection to be ablaze again time therefore was obviously precious at any moment now if the rain ceased altogether the populace in no way cooled by the drenching would once more storm the hill and would discover the fugitive caesar in his retreat already from afar there came to the lonely pedestrian's ear the roar of a mighty wave composed of many sounds which gathering force and fury was ready to dash itself anew upon the imperial hill but up here on the summit there still reigned comparative quietude true that as he walked rapidly along taurus antinor spied from time to time groups of excited chattering men congregated at street corners or under the shelter of a jutting portico whilst now and then from behind the huge piles of builders materials which littered this portion of the palatine darkly swathed figures would emerge at sound of the prefect's footsteps on the flagstones and as quickly vanish again but to these taurus antinor paid no heed they were but the remote echoes of the angry storm below soon the majestic pile of augustus's palace loomed before him on the left with its unending vistas of marble and porphyry colonnades on the right was the temple of jupiter victor on the very summit of the hill an undefinable instinct led the man's footsteps to that lonely height he skirted the temple and anon stood looking down on the panorama of rome stretched out at his feet the palatine sloping downwards in a gentle gradient covered with the dwellings of the rich patricians which formed here a network of intricate and narrow streets below these the great circus redolent of the memories of the past four-and-twenty hours beyond it the aventine with the winding ribbon of the tiber now lost in a leaden-coloured haze the streets from the valley upwards all around the hill were swarming with men who from this distance looked like pygmies fussy and irresponsible spectral too in the rain-laden mist as they appeared to be running hither and thither in compact groups but with seeming aimlessness 
whilst shouting, always shouting, that perpetual call for vengeance and for death. The watcher looked down in silence, for that crowd of pygmies was the people of Rome, who at a word from him would proclaim him Caesar and master of the world. The immensity of the sky was above him, the far horizon partly hidden in gloom, but down there were the people whose voice was raised to deify their chosen hero in the intervals of demanding the death of a tyrant. And the people were the lords of Rome just now, entrenched in the narrow streets, a crowd, one hundred thousand or more strong, held the imperial hill in a solid blockade. Down below, in and around the circus, steel and bronze glittered in the distant vapors. One thousand men of the Praetorium Guard, cut off from the Caesar, had been unable to forge a way through the serried ranks of the populace. Dark masses that lay immovable and stark in the open space around the circus spoke mutely of combats that had been fierce and bloody. But the people had remained victorious. The people held their ground. One hundred thousand fists and staves, a few agricultural and building implements, had asserted their mastery over one thousand swords and shields. The people were the masters of Rome, and they had chosen their Caesar in the hero whom they had already deified. Taurus Antinor's gaze swept over the vista that lay stretched out before him. It pictured the entire political situation of the world city, with treachery lurking on the hill and a determined mob in the valley. The murder of the Caesar was but a question of hours. And after that... After that, the empire of Rome and the dominion of the world for this man who stood here on the watch. He had but to say the word, and that empire would be his. He had but to go back now to find his way with softly treading footsteps to the couch where Dea Flavia's exquisite body lay stretched out in semi-unconsciousness. He had but to take her once more in his arms, to murmur the words of love that, unspoken, seared his lips even now. He had but to close his ears to the still small voice that was God's. And Rome, the mistress of the world, and Dea Flavia, the peerless woman, would be his at the word. Rome, and Dea Flavia, the two priceless guerdons of the earth. They called to him now on the wings of the distant storm, from over the hills and from across the gray, dull mist that obscured the sky. The man stretched out his arms with a gesture of passionate longing. How easy it were to take all! How impossible it seemed to give up everything that made life glorious and sweet. A voice, though an insinuating, trembled in the air. Take all, it said. It is thine for the taking, thine by the will of thousands, thine by the call of one pair of perfect lips. Rome, the unconquered queen, Dea Flavia, holding in her white hands a cup brimming over with happiness, all are thine at the word. The silent watcher cried out in his loneliness and his agony. He held his hands to his ears, for the voice grew more insidious and more real. The empire of the world and Dea Flavia and in the balance, what? An oath rendered to a tyrannical madman, the scourge and terror of mankind, an oath which reason itself 
doth repudiate with scorn. Even thy God would not exact obedience from thee at such a price. His head fell upon his breast, and his knees bent to the earth. It was all so difficult. It seemed well nigh impossible now. No words escaped his lips. He knelt here silent and alone before the face of Rome that but waited to be conquered, before the face of God veiled to his gaze, and around him the distant roll of thunder and the confused shouts of the people from below. Christian, this is thine hour. In silence and in tears thou must make thy last stand against temptation greater mayhap than suffering mankind hath ever had to withstand alone. Everything in the man cried out to him to yield. His love for Dia and his love for Rome and that pride of manhood in him that calls for power over other men, born and bred in luxury-loving paganism, in the worship of might and the deification of the imperium, the Christian had to choose between the world and the master. The battle was fierce and cruel. Gone now was the consciousness of strength, the dignity of the patrician. Here was but a lonely, wretched human creature fighting the tempter for his own soul. He cowered on the ground. The wild driving rain beat against the tawny masses of his hair and lashed the proud, stiff neck that found it so difficult to bend. The tearing wind searched the loosened folds of his mantle and the purple silk of his tunic the emblem of patrician rank. His face was buried in his hands. Heavy sobs shook his broad shoulders. The face of Dia Flavia, exquisitely fair, smiled at him through his closed lids. The warm, mellow masses of her hair entwined themselves around his tear-stained fingers. Her cooing voice called to him, with the ineffable sweetness of love. Christian, it is thine hour, and the battle must be fought out in anguish and in loneliness, with no one nigh thee to comfort and to succor, with no one to see the rending of thy soul or the slow breaking of thy love-filled heart. When thou art lonely and wretched, Dea Flavia had cried in the agony of her wounded love. Call on thy God then, and thou wilt find him silent unto thy prayer, and deaf unto thy woe. And the cry was wrung out from the depths of the tortured heart. O oh God, my God, if thou be willing, take this cup from me. Whilst the man prayed to his God to take his soul into his keeping ere it become perjured and accursed but god was silent because the soul though racked and tempted was too great for the tasting of an easy victory god was silent but he saw the tears that fell heavy and hot upon the ground he was silent, but he heard the cries of anguish, the bitter moans of pain. Christian, this is thine hour, for when thy soul and heart have suffered enough, when they have been weighed in the crucible of divine love and not been found wanting, then will the peace of God which passeth all understanding descend in exquisite comfort upon thee. Gradually the tears ceased to fall, the sobs to shake the massive frame of the kneeling man. His hands dropped from his face, and his gaze went up to the storm-tossed firmament, there where land and sky merged in the gray mists of approaching evening. 
and on the horizon, as he gazed beyond the valley, beyond the Aventine and the murmuring Tiber, already wrapped in gloom, a ray of golden light had rent the lowering clouds. It shone serene and bright, illumined from behind limitless depths by the slanting rays of a slowly sinking sun. Taurus Antinor rose to his feet. He looked and looked upon that light until it tore a wider and ever wider gap in the angry clouds, and its golden radiance spread right across the horizon far away. The very mist now seemed aglow. The waters of the Tiber, tossed by the gale, throw back brilliant sparks of reflected lights. From the low-lying marshes among the reeds, two birds rose in rapid flight and disappeared in that golden haze. My God, not mine, but thy will be done, murmured the lonely man, and anguish folded its sable wings and the tortured heart was at peace. End of chapter 31 Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA.